بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على حبيب إله العالمين أشرف خلق الله وخاتم رسله وسيد أنبيائه حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الغر الميامين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون. Refresh your souls and your sessions and your minds with a powerful salawat for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Theoretically, the main supporters of the Islamic message in the West, in Europe, in North America and the transmitters of Islamic values and Islamic culture are supposed to be the young generation, the youth. Practically, our Islamic institutions and circles and establishments and mosques are virtually deserted by the youth. Our Islamic community and our Islamic establishments, they face, they experience a mass exodus and a flight of the young generation. The young generation are not interested in many of our classical, traditional Islamic programs. Why this is happening? What is the reason? Don't look at this session here packed with youth. I can take you to North America and elsewhere in Europe. When you go to a mosque, an Islamic center nowadays, you find the place is dominated only by men ages between 40 to 80. This is one of the blessings of Allah that we are here among you, the youth. Our hope for the future. Why this is happening elsewhere? Why the Muslim 
circles, foundations and centers are experiencing vacancies. They don't have youth attending their programs. There are two main reasons. One is the ever-increasing gap, the unbridgeable cultural gap between Islamic values and the Western values. The second, there are certain traditional practices and behaviors that the youth are unhappy with them, disaffected with them, disenchanted with them. They don't like them. And this is what bars them from attending many Islamic sessions today in Europe and North America. Before I elaborate on these two phenomena, these two problems that is creating a major predicament for our youth in the West, let me say and remind my brothers and sisters, parents, fathers and mothers who came to this country 20 years, 30 years, maybe 40 years ago. When you came to this country, when you immigrated to the West, to Europe, to America, you should have realized that you are bringing your generation, your children, into a culture which is radically dissimilar with the Islamic faith. I don't know whether you are you were aware about that or not. And therefore today, if you still have not realized this dissimilarity between Islam and the West, you have to realize it and understand it today. Parents, elders, religious leaders, civic leaders in this community, they should understand the major disparities and differences between our culture, the Islamic culture and the Islamic values and the Western youth culture. There are major differences, fundamental differences. Many of our religious and ethical precepts, they run counter to the societal norm in these countries. Some of them are. Let me mention some of these features. And when I mention these features, I'm not advocating them. I'm not suggesting that we have to assimilate ourselves with such features. We have to adapt with them. I'm trying to criticize them. But I'm trying also to tell our parents and elders and leaders in this community, in the Muslim community, that these are the dangers that surround your son and your daughter. You have to be fully aware about them. One of these features is that dating in the West, generally in the West, is accepted as something very normal, dating at a very young age, sometimes at primary school age, is widely accepted. Premarital physical intimacy between the genders is glamorized, celebrated in America and Europe. People feel proud about it. Parents feel very good about it that their daughter has a friend and he's intimate with her. This is a source of a pride for them. Third, drinking alcohol is very encouraged here. Even for some kids as young as two and three years old, when they go to the restaurants by, with their parents, they are offered drink, free drink of alcohol and wine. I was three weeks ago flying from Frankfurt to Los Angeles, going back from Hajj. Behind me, there were parents who were coming back from an Islamic country, Islamic country, Islamic country. The father, the mother in the middle, there were two boys. 
And whenever the flight attendant comes with a bottle of wine, they ask not only for themselves, for their kids. Coming from an Islamic country, I could not sleep for 11 hours during this flight because of the bad, terrible smell of alcohol and wine. Those people come from an Islamic country. This is encouraged here. What else? Women's fashions are designed to intoxicate men, to put feminine attraction and beauty at display. What is left of her honor nowadays? When you look at this dress, this fashion, this style, you would realize that nothing is left for her honor. Nothing is protected. Nothing is covered. And this is why men in such cultures becoming increasingly uninterested in women. This is not a cause of interest in her. Disinterest in her. These are some aspects. And imagine a Muslim boy or girl born into such culture without Islamic education, without Islamic orientation, without Islamic training or values, such person will be compelled to fall in the trap, will be forced to join the mainstream culture. Such person would not feel happy when he comes to an Islamic session. Such person would not feel glad when you take him to the mosque. He would not enjoy the atmosphere of the mosque. What else? There are other cultural disparities. And I believe the most important ones. The most important difference between Islamic culture and the Western culture today is that in Islam, the Islamic culture stresses, emphasizes following authentic traditions following the values of the Quran of the Anbiya all the messengers and apostles and the prophets in particular Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and his pure and immaculate progeny and family and the Islamic culture also encourages that you listen and adhere to ethical and religious judgment. This is the spirit of Islam. Allah says a true Muslim, a true believer in God is the one who obeys the Prophet, does not argue with the Prophet. When you understand the philosophy of Islam, then here you have to listen and obey with good will, with happiness. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا And Islam is what Taslim? This is the spirit of Islam. Not only to accept, but to enjoy with a gratefulness to accept what the Prophet teaches you without any hard feeling inside you. وَيُسَلِّمُ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ When you tell them to do something, they enjoy it. They accept it without argument. They know that this is from God. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ He's the messenger of God. And they know that this is in their favor. It is for them, not against them. This is the spirit of surrenderance and submission. الإسلام هو التسليم Why our religion is dubbed and termed Islam because we believe and we hope I hope we are correct here we believe that we listen to God he's the ultimate leader the ultimate boss we report back to him we don't fear others others feel others we feel we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when you come to the Western culture, in the West, they stress rebellious against 
the society, against the norms. They encourage you to rebel against the societal norms, against the traditions, even if, it's, even if it is the Christian tradition. The Christians are also suffering. I speak to some Christian leaders in America, Christian ministers, they tell me that don't think that you, the Muslims, are abused here in America. We are also abused. We are also attacked. We are also defamed and marginalized. We have the same problem. Encourages rebellion against religious tradition. Encourages individualism. What does it mean, individualism here? This is one of the most important pillars of the Western civilization and the Western culture is individualism. One of them is individualism. What does it mean? It means that you come first, society comes second. You are more important than the society. You have to be free, enjoy your freedom, even if it comes at the expense of others. Enjoy your time. Do not restrict yourself. Do not deprive yourself. If you believe something is good for you, go and do it without hesitation. Even if it runs counter to your parents' desire and parents' thoughts, don't listen to your parents. Look at yourself. Enjoy your time. Enjoy your time. Never restrict yourself. This is the meaning of individualism. This is how the kids, the new generation, are encouraged in the schools. You know the first day when a child goes to America, a first grader, you know what is the first thing they teach him or her? I don't know what they teach them in England, but I know what they teach them in America. The very first thing a child is taught in America is how to dial the emergency line, 911. Why? You know why? Not because if he sees a fire there. No, not because of that. Not because if he sees an accident. But because if your father or mother said, No! Scary no to you. They yell at you. Yell. Not touch you. Yell at you. Call 911. And say, My father yelled at me. Come, please. Come to my rescue. I'm dying. They come and they take you away. Take it to another family. This is a bad father who yells at you. You know what happens to those people? Such a person who flee the family because his father yells at him, Allah is going to afflict him with a misery. He goes outside, searches for a friend, he gets a girlfriend, and his girlfriend, she yells at him and screams at him ten times a day, and he says, yes, sir, to her. When you refuse your parents, you would not enjoy it somewhere else. You're going to suffer somewhere else. Don't think that happiness is outside the family. I know a man who's going to take care of me. I know a lady. She's going to embrace me, salvage me, provides me with love and compassion. If you deny and reject your mother's compassion, no one can provide you with the true compassion. No one. Therefore, here they encourage you that you come first. Islam teaches me from day one that Allah is first. Don't be selfish. Put Allah first. Because you are the slave of Allah. Allah puts you on this earth for a few days. For a test and a trial. Then you're going to go back to him. Allah wants to see the reason why we spend some years on this earth the reason is to see to examine us to see whether he is we take commands from him or from someone else or from our bad soul and nafsul ammara bisu this is why we are here on the earth allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the early muslims and this is a declaration for all of us Qul, إن كان آباؤكم وأبناؤكم وإخوانكم وأزواجكم وعشيرتكم 
اقترفتموها the business the money that you make وتجارة تخشون كسادها ومساكن ترضونها أحب إليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين If you take others even if they are immediate family members but you give them the priority before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you tell them you are first Allah is second even if he is your father, your son, your wife, your brother, your business, your money, your house, you are so attached to it. Allah says, wait for the punishment to come. The Prophet one day turned to his companions and he says, لا يبلغ أحدكم حلاوة الإيمان حتى أكون means the Prophet. You would never attain the sweet of real faith unless I the Prophet become to him closer to him than his father mother kids wealth money حَتَّى أَكُونَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ وَمَالِهِ وَوُلْدِهِ Umar ibn al-Khattab the second Khalifa he turned to the Prophet he said Ya Rasulullah I love you so much I love you more than my parents, more than my house, more than my money. Accept myself. I love myself more than you. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith. The Prophet says, this is not the real faith. Unless you love me more than yourself. The Prophet says to him, you have to love me, the Prophet. Because when you love the Prophet, this is a gesture of loving whom? Huh? Loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you love the family of the Prophet, this is the gesture, indication that you love the Prophet and Allah. This is why the Prophet tells us, أَكْثَرُكُمْ نُورًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَكْثَرُكُمْ, أكثركم حُبًّا لِأَهْلِ بَيْتِ <laughs> Day of judgment is a day of darkness. No lights. Lights are off. No more sun, no more reflection of the moon, no lights. يَوْمَ تَرَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَسْعَى نُورُهُمْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ You come with the light with you. If you are a believer, you have a light. The strongest light on that day of extreme darkness is the light of a believer who carries the love of Ahl al-Bayt in his heart, in his or her heart. You're going to have a strong light on that day. حُبُّنَا يُكَفِّرُ الذنوب. The Prophet says one of the fast ways of redeeming your sins, redeeming sins, is to have love and affection for Ahlul Bayt and fellowship of course, to follow them. Al-Imam Al-Radha alayhi salatu wasalam, he says, if you have too much sins, you have done too much sins, and you are finding the best way to erase them, to throw them away. The Imam says, فَلْيُكْثِرْ فَلْيُكْثِرْ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ Frequently you have to say this, frequently. Because once you say it, you remember the Prophet, the family of the Prophet. And if you remember the Prophet and his family, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you are in, if you are in, about to, have, to, to commit a sin, once you remember Allah. Why do we commit a sin? Because one second of forgetfulness. We experience only one second of forget, forgetfulness. One second, no more. At that second... We become weak and the shaitan attacks us. وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ But once you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you create an immunity against sinfulness. So this is the main difference between the Islamic culture and the culture of the West. Going back to the youth predicament. Here, I want you to since you have a general idea about why our youth are disenchanted, estranged,
from our Islamic centers and our Islamic circles and in order for us to find solutions for them to come back we do not create a center Islamic center for the all generation although we do respect them they have rights but you are the hope of Islam the youth especially the youth as I mentioned two nights ago that you are the first line of defense for Islam and if you look at the camp of Imam Hussein the majority of the camp consisted of people like you your age the youth so now you have an idea about the core problem between the two cultures the clash the schism the dichotomy between the two cultures now let's go zoom in on some details and for the time left for me I'm going to mention two aspects no more two aspects of the clash between the two civilizations and the two cultures that reflects on us we become the victims here our youth become victims of it one I call it the orthodox or the orthodoxy and the other is the proxy orthoproxy I mean by the first one the problem that our youth have with certain perceptions ideas opinions in Islam within Islam what I mean by the second one is some of the concerns of our youth about some practices customs traditions as to the first one concerns about some of the ideas in our religion in our tradition and when I say youth my dear brothers and sisters I mean not only the Shia youth I mean all the Muslim youth I am addressing here all the Muslims Sunnis and Shias alike most of the youth they have a problem with some aspects of our thoughts opinions and ideas Islamic ideas when it comes to the especially to the classical texts when it comes to the Holy Quran Alhamdulillah we unanimously agree that the Quran is the book of Allah and Quran is authentic and I at least I I speak about myself I have never confronted a youth who tells me that I reject the Quran I dislike the Quran I do not accept this Quranic section sanction or injection yes I have met many youth who tell me I have a problem understanding this subject in the Quran I have a problem understanding this ayah this injunction but they do accept it and if you have a problem you have to study the solution is to study Quran is open for understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts this peculiarity in the Quran that once you devote yourself to understanding to the understanding of the Quran your heart is going to open up and you're going to enjoy it once you decide that I don't like this book I am bored with it I don't understand it you would never open up for that book it depends on you your intention to the believers healing salvation mercy for those who believe in it for those who like it and want to understand it and you will find yourself you understand and enjoy the Quran as to the other party hmm? more loss and becoming away and away further and further away from the Holy Quran Al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam he says fi al Quran ibaratun lil awam wa isharatun lil khawas wa lataifu lil awliya wa haqaiqu lil asfiya 
Quran is like an ocean. In this ocean, some people just swim on the shores, close to the beach. Some of them, they go further. Some of them, they go deeper. And some of them, they dive really, really deep. They go close to the Titanic, several hundreds of meters deep. For the awam, those who don't have time for the Quran, they understand nothing but the surface of the Quran. But for those who want to be specialists in the Quran, they can go deep. So there is no problem with the Quran. The problem and the suffering within the youth community, Muslim youth community today, and I am saying again, not only the Shias. In fact, here in this point, I refer to our brothers, the Sunnis. The major predicament is that when it comes to the Hadith literature, the traditions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Criticism of the hadith is banned is a taboo. They have to accept it at face value. Whatever the hadith says, especially when it co comes to the six books, six books, the two sahih and the other four, which makes the six. This is the source of hadith in the Sunni tradition. The tradition in the school of Sahaba is to sanctify is to idealize, canonize these books. Whatever in them is authentic and correct and it is not open for discussion or debate. You can't debate them. It's very difficult, very hard even to question the authenticity, the worthiness, even the relevance of any hadith. You have to accept the hadith there. Someone who goes here to the best school and he's academically, he's trained to criticize. You know, in the West, in the religious tradition in the West, they teach the students to criticize. We don't worship the text. We worship, we respect the rational, not the text itself. The text, even the Bible, is open for discussion and a criticism. This is how they train them. Historical and textual criticism. Very important. For such a person, a Muslim youth who goes to university here, and they teach him to criticize, to challenge, to debate, to reject sometimes if you don't like. When it comes to the hadith, and you tell him, whatever in these books, thousands of hadith in these six books, they are all authentic and you have to accept it. Even if it con contradicts his mind and his reason, you consider all the companions holy and what they say is holy too. A hadith, such a hadith like, Ashabi kan nujum muqtadaytum ihtadaytum. All my companions. The hadith that has been attributed falsely to the Prophet. And you know many prominent Sunni scholars, transmitters of hadith, they refute this one in particular. They don't accept it. They report that the Prophet said one day, all my companions, and you know the definition of companions? Even if he sees the Prophet, if someone comes here, enters the room and there is no room to stay, he just looks at me one glance. He becomes my companion. And he receives immunity against criticism. You can't criticize him. He becomes Sahabi, holy. When we in the Shia tradition, we say we have 14 ma'asum, they say, wow, ma'asum, sinless. But they made a hundred thousand person ma'asum, and this is okay. This is okay to be ma'asum. These things does not work for our youth. And this is why I, I spoke, I have spoken with many, 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 many of our youth in Europe, in America. They tell me if this is Islam, if these hadiths, we consider them, treat them as correct, beyond criticism, beyond any debate, although they contradict my reason. If Ashabi Kan Najum is a correct hadith, 
then why the Ashab were fighting with each other? Read the history of Islam. Why they were fighting with each other? Why they killed each other? Why they excommunicated each other? One of them, a Sahabi who sees the Prophet and was with the Prophet, he says to another one who again was with the Prophet, he tells them, you are Kafir, you are non-Muslim. He excommunicates him from Islam. And they all are like stars. Whoever you follow, you get guided. Is this true? Another hadith in, this, in these books, in these books, hadith about Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. Attribute again falsely this hadith to the Prophet that he said, there are only three trustees for God's revelation. God's message has only three protectors and three trustees. Ana, meaning the Prophet, Wajibra'il, second, and the third one, Mu'awiyah, or Mu'awiyah. Imagine. This is Islam. And you come to someone who wants to find out about real Islam and you tell him this hadith. They again report that the Prophet one day, he loved Mu'awiyah so much. The Prophet was enchanted by Mu'awiyah. He said to him, Mu'awiyah, خُذْ هَذَا السَّامْ حَتَّى تَلْقَانِي بِهِ فِي الْجَنَّةِ Take this arrow with you and I will see you next time in paradise. But they didn't say the Prophet Mu'awiyah is going to do what with that arrow? I don't know. These are some, some examples. I don't want to spend more time on this. Just to give you a glance of why why the Muslim youth, especially the intellectuals, they are disenchanted with the religious establishment. And don't tell me these hadiths are being recited in the Middle East. Today you go to many mosques in this country, here in the United Kingdom. You go to North America, you see the same hadith are being repeated again and again and again. And you can't argue with that. You have to accept that as something authentic, something sacred and holy. And you have to believe in it and act upon that. You can't convince the youth that our tradition is the best. And then you go to another aspect, the practical aspect, some practices, some customs. Again, our youth are again disaffected, disenchanted. They don't believe. Some of them, they question the validity, not of Islam, no, of these past scholarly opinions, past imams, not infallible imams, imams of hadith and imams of tafsir, because of these practices. If you come to one example, the mosque culture in the West, mostly in Europe, in North America, and again, specifically in the Sunni tradition. You will find the mosque culture is hopelessly misogynist against women. Women are not welcomed. Women do not find communal reception and warmth in the masjid in the Islamic center. The masjid is considered primarily a male territory dominated by men. Even the youth don't go to the mosque. Go to any masjid today in America and, 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 and Europe and sometimes the Middle East and count for me how many youth you find in the, inside the masjid. How many youth? They are deserted by the youth, by women. You know, you don't find it a family-friendly territory the masjid while if you look at the church the church in the west is an, an institution that welcomes the whole family on sunday the whole family goes to the church the father the mother those who go to the church of course they all go to the church they all pray together they all listen to the preaching together and sing songs together they enjoy the experience but I have seen in many mosques, 
Many of them, we do have exceptions, of course. I am not criticizing all of them. We do have some exceptions. But in many of them, the family is not welcomed. Only the man goes to the masjid. You know, in the other tradition, women are discouraged to go to the masjid. And for those of them who venture and defy and go to the masjid, they are relegated to the corners, cold, dumb, dark corners of the masjid. I wonder if we want our mothers and our wives to be the first, first students of the children, how can we ban them from going to the masjid? Why we do that? If we want our youth to represent Islam, to be the true ambassadors of Islam in the West, to be the embodiment of the Islamic culture and character, why then they are not in the masjid? Why do you build the masjid? What are the solutions? Solutions are many. One of them, brothers and sisters, wherever you go, and tomorrow some of you are going to be leaders in this community, inshallah. Many of you are going to be so influential in this community. And I, when I was living in America, in, in, in this country, in UK, many years ago, some of you were so small kids. Today I see you, alhamdulillah, many of you are married. Some of you have kids. Those who are sitting here, you are going to grow. And you have to do something about this problem. Not only for yourself, for the next generation. The generation who is being born and raised in this country. We don't want to see always Islamic institutions and circles abandoned and deserted by the young generation. We want to see any masjid today in Europe, in America, any masjid, any Husseiniyah, any Islamic centers like this one, full of youth, a magnet that brings the youth. So what do we do? We have to make it less hostile to women and youth, the masjid, youth welcoming, to feel that this is his place, to have a sense of ownership, the youth should be a shareholder in the masjid. When he goes to the masjid, he feels happy. Going to the masjid for many of our kids and youth and women is not a pleasant experience. It's not at all. This is one. Second, brothers and sisters, the masjid in Islam since the inception of Islam, the masjid has been the intellectual hub and center. But nowadays, when you look at the masjid, it is not so. It is not. Masjid is only a place of worship. Go there sometimes. If the masjid is open, pray five times a day. There is no room for questioning. There is no room for learning. There is no room for debate. There is no place for discussion. There is no alim scholar to discuss anything with him you know how many people in america they converted to islam especially after 9 11 9 11 had two impacts one bad and one good bad because it gave a wrong picture depicted a very terrible picture about islam in the whole world but the good one about it it was an eye-opening for many Americans to come to discover Islam, the beauty of Islam. I remember myself. I remember immediately after 9-11, Muslim population were so intimidated. They did not come to the masjid. When I go to Salat al-Jum'ah Friday prayers, I see more Americans than Muslims. When I go to certain programs, I see more non-Muslims than Muslims. They came. The masjid was a magnet for them. But unfortunately, after that, they realized that, no, no, this is not our place. And I always say to the converts, those are brothers and sisters who convert to Islam, I always say to them, 
that I want you to get familiar with Islam before you get familiar with the Muslims. Because if you get to know the Muslims first, you're going to be shocked and dumbfounded. So I want you to study Islam now before you meet any Muslim to realize the difference between theory and a practice. It is radically dissimilar between theory and a practice. So the center has to be, the masjid has to be the center of learning as it used to be during the time of the Prophet. One day the Prophet وسلم, comes to his masjid and he finds two circles next to each other. One praying, worshipping, the second one studying. The Prophet smiled and he said, Kilahuma ala khair. Both are good. But then he pointed to the one who was studying, discussing knowledge. He said, My mission in this life is to teach. Is to teach. And if you don't learn, you can't worship. Most of the Muslims today, they do pray. But what else after the prayers? Do they have self-restraint against fahsha and munkar, evil and wrongdoing? No. Because their prayers is customary. They have been habituated. Becomes part of his life. So he has to pray. Just like having lunch and dinner. You have to. Even if you don't like it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I want you to enjoy the prayers. And when you stand for the prayers, remember you are standing before Allah and imagine that this is the last salat you are doing the last salat maybe you would not get the opportunity to do another salat and let me conclude with this point what we need also in the west in our religious establishments and circles brothers and sisters we need scholars who can communicate with the youth in the language that the youth understand and relate to them through their educational and intellectual background. There are some modern issues that we are facing today. Even the ulamas, they don't have answer to it. You as a youth who go to university, you come to a scholar and ask him and he does not have the answer. That would not be that would not be encouragement for you to go again to the same masjid or to the same place. And we need some homegrown religious scholars from within you. Stop importing scholars from outside. This is not good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ To become specialists, to specialize in the affairs of faith, in theology, in Islamic jurisprudence, لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلْيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ We need a homegrown, and I am very happy to see some houses and seminaries here. And you have to join both, converge both, academic studies at universities and a traditional, classical, Islamic studies in the house and the seminary. We need such leaders for the future of Islam in America and Europe, in the West. Some of you have to volunteer. Don't say, no, not me, my neighbor. You have to be one of them. You have to be one of them. If Allah seeks goodness for his servant, he will open his eyes. To study faith and religion and to be the servant of Islam. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam and Ahlul Bayt, they are waiting to see some of you to volunteer for this task. Now let's go to Ali al Akbar alayhi salatu was salam. One of the heroes of the day of Ashura, one of the heroes of the mission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam is his son Ali al Akbar who was 27 years old. On the day of Ashura, Ali al-Akbar, 
He could have stayed because he was married and he had kids. He could have stayed in Medina, in Mecca, not joining his father. His father never forced him to go. Imam Hussein never forced anyone to join him. When he gave that sermon in Medina, he said, I'm going to leave. Whoever wants to join me, he's welcome on board. If you wants to reject me, Asbir. I will be patient. I would not even criticize you. I would not be even unhappy with you. Nobody was forced. But those people who want, they want because of understanding. They had a mission in this life. They had a role in this life. And they know that Allah will be happy with them once they fulfill that mission, noble mission. Ali al Akbar السلام, was one of them. In the camp of Imam Hussein, you find Ali al Akbar, who is 27 years old, and the smallest and the youngest member, who is only six months old. Ali al Azhar, the senior, the junior, and the senior. And they both gave their life. Allah wanted both and many others of the children of Imam Hussein to give their life on that day, on that important day, on that landmark in the history of Islam, on that turning point in the history of Islam that we still cherish today. We live with it today. It's a source of inspiration not only for the Shia today, it is the source of inspiration for all the Muslims, all those who love freedom, who love humanity, all the oppressed people worldwide. كُلُّ يَوْمٍ عَشُورَاء وَكُلُّ أَرْضٍ كَرْبَلَا Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam came to Karbala with his father, one the companions of Imam Hussein, the Ashab, they gave their life for the sake of Allah and the truth and none, none of them survived the turn came to the immediate family of Al Hussein السلام, his immediate family who volunteers first Imam Hussein has brothers he has nephews he has cousins and he has children so who volunteers first Ali al Akbar was the first man he asked his father permission. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He was so despondent of him. He knew that the trip that he's going, he's going, he's about to make was the last trip of him. وَرَفَعَ شَيْبَتَهُ الْمُقَدَّسَ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَقَالَ اللَّهُمَّ اشْهَدْ عَلَيْهِمْ فَقَدْ بَرَزَ إِلَيْهِمْ غُلَامٌ أَشْبَهُ النَّاسِ خَلْقًا وَخُلْقًا وَمَنْطِقًا بِرَسُولِكْ وَكُنَّا إِذَا اشْتَقْنَا إِلَى رَسُولِكْ نَظَرْنَا إِلَى وَجْهِ هَذَا الْغُلَامِ O oh Allah, testify. Be a witness against them on the day of judgment. That whenever we crave to see the face of the Prophet, not only Imam Hussein, even the people of Medina, the people of Medina, whenever they longed to see the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they come to the house of Ali al-Akbar to see his face. Whenever they long to hear the voice of the Prophet, the tone of the Prophet, they listen to the voice of Ali al-Akbar. He bears strong resemblance and likeness to his grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam in all three departments khalqan wa khulqan wa mantiqan in his physical appearance in his manners and in his tone of speech and then Imam Hussein recited this ayah in Allah astafa Adam wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala al-alameen Imam Hussein gave him permission. Many of the Ashab and many of the family members of his camp, when they came seeking permission, he didn't give them permission right away. Al-Abbas, he did not give him permission. Al-Qasim did not give him permission right away. Unless, until Qasim was insistence, 
But Ali al Akbar, Imam Hussein, gave him permission. He's his son, he loves him. But Imam Hussein is giving a sacrifice to Allah. Min al Mu'minina Rijalun, Sadaqu Allah Ali. This is the ultimate sacrifice. In Allah Ashtara min al Mu'minina Amfusahum wa Amwalahum, bi anna lahum al Jannah. He gave him permission. The entire camp of Imam Hussein gathered around Ali in Al Akbar. All women, all ch children, they came out of the tent and they gathered and circled around him. Ya Ali, irham ghurbatana. Ya Ali, la taqata lana ala firaqik. O oh Ali, O oh Ali, don't leave us alone here. O oh Ali, we will be left alone without you. Ali, stay with us. Don't go, Ya Ali. Ali al Akbar. He knew that he made a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's not going to back from that covenant. He went to the battlefield. Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. Nahnu wa rabbi al bayt awla bin nabi. Adribukum bis safe ahmi an ebi darba gulamin ha shemiyin. Qurashi, tallahi la yahkum wa fi nabn al-da'i. He introduced himself first to the enemies, to the camp of Bani Umayyah. But a lady was waiting for him, and that lady was his mother, Layla, alayha salam. Layla, when Ali bid farewell to the family, women and children, to his father, she went inside the tent. Maybe she could not take it. She could not bid farewell to her son. Uh, she's a mother and you can't blame her. She went inside the tent. She would look at the face of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He would reflect for her the event in the battlefield. Suddenly the face of the Imam changed. Turned grim. She rushed to him. To the Imam alayhi salam, قالت أبا عبد الله هل أصيب ولدي بشيء؟ قال كلا ولكن برز إليه من يخاف عليه من. Nothing has happened to him yet, but Layla, this is the time of du'a. This is the time of the prayers. This is the time where you should besiege Allah subhanahu wa taala and pray for him. يا ليلى ادخل الخيمة وادعي لولدك فإني سمعت جدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله يقول دعاء الأم مستجاب بحق ولدها دخلت ليلى إلى خبائها جردت خمارها نشرت شعرها رفعت يديها إلى السماء she went inside the tent. She unveiled her cover. And then she spread her hair. She raises her hand in the prayers. Ilahi bi ghurbati abi abdillah. Ya radda yusuf ala yaqub. Ya kashif adhurri ayyub. Urdud alayya waladi. O Lord, O Allah. O oh Allah that returned Yusuf to his father Yaqub after 40 years of separation. O oh Allah who removed the adversity and affliction from Ayyub. O oh Allah, I want you to bring my son back to me unharmed and safe. Ya Aba Tabbat al Khamat al Gharib. Wutwasilat lalla bhabib. بحسين وش ما بمصيبة يا راد يوسف من مغيبة اليعقوب ومسج النحيبة أنا أريد أن علي سالم تجيبة ما استتم دعاءها إلا ويعود إليها علي الأكبر he came back from the battlefield asking for some water from his father his father said to him Bunaya Ali idhab ila ummika qabla an tamut go and save your mother she is about to die now if she doesn't see you she will die now Ali al-Akbar came to his mother 
He's trying to calm her, to comfort her. Oh, my dear mother, look at all those women around you, all those wives around you. They gave their children, they gave their husbands for the sake of Allah, defending Islam. And they will come on the day of judgment, they will stand proudly before my grandmother Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Oh dear mother, you don't want to be proud before Fatima to Zahra? Ala turidi an takuni marfu'at al-ra'is amama jaddati Fatima. قالت بلى بلى بني بيض الله وجهك ولكن تخطى أمامي خطوات حتى أتزود من النظر إليك The only request I have from you before you leave to the battlefield again that you walk before me just a few steps so I can have the last glance on you my dear son يقل هاد قل له يا وليد يا ابني هالساعة وتفارقني دقل لي على فراقك اش يصبرني وحيد يا ضو عيوني وحيد يا ضو عيوني وبيك الدهر خيبني يا ابني ما اقدر الفقاك وخذني للمعارة وياك حتى انشتل يا ابني هناك Eventually he bid farewell to his mother too and he went for the last trip to the battlefield he was fighting there فجاءه مرة ابن منقذ العبد وضربه بالعمود على رأسه he struck him, he dealt him a blow on his head. Al Akbar at that moment he hanged to his horse. فأخذه الفرس إلى مخيم الأعداء فأحاطوا به من كل جانب. The horse, the horse could not see his way, so he took him to the enemy camp. They encircled him from all direction, and they started raining him with their swords, with their arrows, and they cut him into pieces. نادى أبتاه عليك من السلام هذا جد قد زقاني بكأس الأوفى شربة لا أضمأ بعدها أبدا This is my grandfather as you promised me Now I can see my grandfather extending to me a cup of a drink I am drinking this and there is another one reserved for you وإن لك كأسا مذخورا فالعجل العجل الإمام الحسين came to him He saw his son being cut into pieces His body being decapitated ألقى بنفسه عليه نادى وولدا وعليا إمام حسين بنز at that moment and زينب she leaves the tent when she hears إمام حسين خرجت من الخباء وعليا وابن أخاه الإمام came to her he stood he took her arm he said يا زينب ألا تعلمي أن خدرك يا عز علي من ولدي علي you are more honorable than my son Ali. I don't want you to be outside the tent. Allahu Akbar. Imam Hussein bends on his son. He puts his cheek on his cheek. He says, بُعْدًا لِقَوْمٍ قَتَلُوكَ May Allah never grant them mercy or salvation. وَخَصْمُهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ جَدُّكَ وَأَبُوكَ أَرِيدَمْ سَحِجْ رُوحَكْ وَشِمْ خَدَّكَ وحط صدري على صدرك ووزدك وحط صدري على صدرك ووزدك يا ابن علي يا فتشة العين يا ابن صواب الصايب كوين أنا منين جتني كرب لمنين يا كوكبا ما كان أقصر عمره وكذا تكون كواكب الأسحار نسألك اللهم وندعوك
Let's stand before the dua to receive one of the